Welcome to The People's House with Congresswoman Betty McCollum, a discussion of the important issues in Washington, D.C. and Minnesota that affect all of us. Hi, I'm Betty McCollum, and I have the honor and privilege of being the member of Congress, the Congresswoman for the 4th Congressional District, which includes all of Ramsey County, of course, which has our capital city, St. Paul, parts of Washington County, and my hometown, South St. Paul, and some of the surrounding, surrounding communities. Today, what we're going to do is talk to two leaders in our community, and they're leaders in many different ways from what they do in their personal lives as, uh, as parents, as volunteers, what they've done in their professional lives before they were elected, and what they continue to do as uh, people who uh, just want to make our communities a better place to live. Joining me today, and I'm going to go by uh, order of seniority, is uh, House Representative Nora Slawick. Nora sat in front of me when I served in the Minnesota House. Um, Nora, when she was first elected, had one son and uh, delivered a healthy baby girl yes. during the session. Yes. And Nora, I remember you having to get permission to leave the floor to take care of, um, yeah. of your child at times because we don't have any facility to accommodate women right off the house floor. Right. The other person who's with me, and I'm going to have them do a fuller introduction. I had to know uh, when he was chief of police of St. Paul, John Harrington, who is now Senator Harrington from the east side of St. Paul. And uh, just well respected, a person that when I did uh, national nights out, people were always happy to see him, always had a smile for him, and John always had a smile for others. So uh, Nora, why don't you tell us sure. a little about, about your career path and maybe Great. what committees you're serving on and then we'll have John do the same thing and then we're just gonna talk about public service. Sure, well great to be here Betty and I remember serving with you back on the Health and Human Services Committee and uh, my little girl who was uh, born back in my first term is now 14 and taller than me. <laughs> so hard to believe how, how time flies and how things change. I still sit on the Health and Human Services Finance Committee and have for all my seven terms uh, that I've served now. I also serve on um, Ways and Means as well as state government finance. Uh, I'm the lead on early ed, so early ed falls apart in the Health and Human Services area with all the child care funding, about $200 million, and then the rest in the education area, about $200 million. Uh, it came from a background of working for United Way, uh, for the Boy Scouts, uh, for university doing fundraising. And uh, right now I'm teaching for the University of Minnesota um, on early childhood, so it allows me to uh, work with students on a topic that I love, which is you know investing in human capital, and then that's the best investment that you can make, as noted by experts like Art Rolnick and others. So glad to be here. Former Federal Reserve Chairman, when he says invest in uh, kids, you've got some really uh, big economy talking points behind you. Yep, yeah. absolutely. John. How well, did you become a police officer? <laughs> well, actually, that's really simple. I, I grew up South Side Chicago kid, and I two parents. Uh, mom's a social worker. Uh, dad was a Cook County deputy sheriff, and I grew up with these really, literally giants. Because in Chicago, to be a cop, you're really usually about six foot two, 250 <laughs> pounds, two or three guns. Those were <laughs> those were the guys that came into the house after shift uh, to have a drink with my dad. And this is back in the late 50s, early 60s, when as a child, if you were silent but there, you could sit and listen to the stories of them jumping over the L train to save babies and kicking in doors and the gunfights. And I was hooked from about the time I was, you know, five years old on. I knew I, nothing else I ever wanted to do with a cop. Ended up in St. Paul after Dartmouth College uh, because St. Paul was hiring and New York had just laid off 2,000 cops. Otherwise, I'd probably <laughs> still be on the East Coast. Spent 33 years as a St. Paul cop, loved every day of it, and ended my career with the last six years as chief of police. Um, it was time to move on, had groomed kind of my successor, and had done a lot of the things that I really wanted to do. We had really seen domestic violence drop. We'd really seen gang violence drop, which were my two big priorities. And uh, Mimua, a, a dear friend from the Hmong community, uh, sort of at the last minute decided she wasn't going to run for re-election and I mm -hmm. lived in that neighborhood and lots of people said this would be another way for you to serve and so I took on the challenge of elected office for the first time uh, was successful and now I am I'm no longer the most junior member of the Senate Mary Jo McGuire uh, actually has that title 
but uh, came into the Senate as one of the freshmen and probably the most pure freshman because having never sat in elected office, really didn't understand committees and all of the structures and the pomp and circumstance of the Senate. So I'm still on the learning curve. I serve on public safety. I serve on K-12 education or E-12 education, local governments. And then I've had a couple other odd assignments at the end. I got put on the redistricting committee uh, and I also now serve on the ethics committee, uh, which has been, I've had one ethics case that we've heard, which uh, was a painfully long process. Wow. So you both, what, what prompted you to run for office? I, I hadn't planned on running for office. Um, my daughter fell off of a piece of playground equipment in North St. Paul. Oh. Um, I went, we went and talked to the neighbors. She was fine, although she had fractured her skull. It, didn't necessarily have to have a great outcome, but mm -hmm. she was fine. And uh, neighbors are like, well, we, you know, we need to do the next step. We've kind of told the city they need to fix this up. They haven't done it. You know, I said, well, let's go down and talk to them together. And the let's turned out to be me, where I met Mayor Sandberg and the city manager, mm -hmm. and they were absolutely fabulous people. And we found out that there was an opening on the city council, and people encouraged me to run. I did. I came in dead mm. dog last, because mm. they had just moved it to North St. Paul from <laughs> South St. Paul. I didn't grow up in North St. Paul. Mm. The mayor put me on uh, the park committee. He said I ran a positive campaign and uh, really thought I could add value. And then I ran uh, a couple of years later and uh, did better than the unopposed mayor in two of the precincts. Never let him forget that. And I miss Bill Sandberg to this day. He was a great mentor and friend. But what was kind of the, the, the click? I mean, John, you mentioned people came up to you and, and, and that was kind of my, my circumstance. And lots of times people think, well, you know, you wanted to do this your whole life. You wanted to be a cop your whole life. What made you think um, that this is something that, that you could really um, you know, sink your teeth into, uh, feel empowered from it. Because you worked with legislators passing laws. Oh, sure. So you know if you don't pass the law right, it, it won't be a good thing. So did you see that as part of what you could bring to the job? Well, there's a couple of things. One, uh, being one of the east side of St. Paul is not the east side that I moved into 33 years ago uh, when it was German and Irish. Uh, it's a community where Hmong, Black, Latino, um, Somali, all uh, Native Americans all make up the East Side. And one of the things that I was real concerned about was that um, there is a, the, a real shortage of people of color in the legislature. Um, there are about, we're about 26% of the population overall in terms of the cities, but we make up only about 6% of the, the legislators. And so one of the things that really pushed me was the idea that I could bring the voice of, uh, of black Minnesotans, of black St. Paulites, I had a long history with the Hmong community. They were very passionate about mm -hmm. uh, me running. The Latino community was very passionate about me running. So I had, I had a lot of friends who said, we think you will be able to carry our water uh, at the legislature. Uh, you will be a known factor. Uh, the fact that I'd been chief of police and had testified on bills and had some friends and colleagues there made, at least I think to them, they, they saw me as someone who would be there, who would be a reasonable person. They knew me from the chief's job, they knew I was an accessible person, and they knew that I was somebody that was really focused on getting things done. Uh, that, that I was going to take this on, this was, I was taking it on to solve problems, not because I needed the, uh, because I needed the extra work, actually, so. Well, we were talking earlier today, and I said you were used to people sometimes not being happy with you, uh, arresting them, maybe yelling at you for arresting them, and now sometimes you're in a parade and people are uh, yelling other things uh, at you, but for the most part, People are glad to see a police officer. You call them when you need them. And uh, I have found that uh, people really do want us to bring value to our work in improving uh, their access to government as uh, people call needing help with, uh, in my office, it's more federal issues now. But when I was a state representative, it was fishing license or why is this happening or I'm a small business and you know what do I do to make sure that I'm in compliance for all my licensing and that. But you had more of a nonprofit right. sector experience that you brought with you to the job, didn't you? Exactly, and I was out uh, in, the, in the suburbs, it's a little different um, because there's, as reps, we're, we're just not as well known or, or name recognized 
Commission. And what happened in my case is I would moderate the uh, League of Women Voters forums out in the Woodbury Cottage Grove League. And so I was moderating a forum and um, one of the legislators at the time, Pam Neary, who's from Afton, came up to me and said, you know, have you ever thought about running for office? I thought, well, not really, but that's an interesting idea. And within a year, the seat where I'm located became, became open. Walt Pearlt had that seat. Uh, and so at that time, she came to me and she said, I really would like a woman to run for this seat. I've approached five different women, and will you think about this? And at that time, it was right before caucuses, so about February. Um, I said, let me think about that. Had a son going into kindergarten. Um, talked to a lot of people, and a lot of people were, were excited about a candidacy. They were excited about my nonprofit background, my work with the League, and the League is a nonpartisan group. Um, I helped uh, start the YMCA in Woodbury, so a lot of East Metro contacts with a lot of folks out there. Um, and of course, talked with my family, and they said, I think this is something we should go for. So actually, out of the five she approached, I was the only one yes, that yes. stepped forward. And we were in a really good position because we were able to caucus uh, and come out running for the office um, right as he announced for retirement. So brought all my neighbors and all my friends and uh, to, to the caucus, and that certainly helped. Um, the other thing, you know, you talked a little bit about your daughter and the playground equipment is uh, my son, when he was three, uh, was kicked out of preschool. And so we all know about those early interventions for little kids and how important they are. And he was, uh, the, the question came, uh, you know, have you talked to your school district? No. Didn't know I was supposed to talk to my school district. Well, you do, and that's where kids with you had a delay in I was uh, say, language. I mean, it wasn't wasn't anything he was doing wrong that he was no, he removed couldn't. from the preschool. He yeah. just didn't have the right uh, set of interventions to help him be successful. Exactly, and couldn't communicate, so couldn't tell them. Look, I don't like what's happening here. It was a Montessori where you're supposed to be self-directed, and, and here was a kid that uh, couldn't had difficulty with that. Um, so we both we all learned a lot from that, and I think as I thought about running for office you know in special education boy there's there's a lot to be improved we have great teachers and a uh, great process but as we know it that can be done better too and and getting the funding and that focus again on those early interventions so all those things combined uh, ran for office and was elected um, I do have to say I had a little bump in the road when Ventura came in uh, I remember a lot of women in the house lost I was one of those and then was able to come back uh, the next term. So mine are non-consecutive, but great experience.